Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Navigating um, Business Medicine and Business to Impact Underserved com uh, Communities session. Um, we are just waiting on one more panelist to um, come in, so feel free to go grab a drink before the um, session starts. Tosin, can you can you see? Is everything okay? Can you see me? I'm. Or are you sending me messages by any chance? Yes, because um, Dr. Butler had sent messages through the chat, so I'm sending them back to him. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, thought I, I thought I was missing something for myself. No, no. Okay. We're just trying to get him to sign back in the way that he did before. Sure. Okay, um, I think we're gonna get started and hopefully Dr. Butler can um, join us um, a little bit later. 
So I'm going to get started with the introductions. Um, hi everyone, my name is Tosin. I am a third year um, at Temple um, and I will be moderating this panel today. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Pitts. Um, Dr. Neil Pitts has 35 years in the pharmaceutical industry, 30, 20 of which, sorry, were um, spent leading clinical research teams in the management and design um, of clinical trials focused on the treatment of depression and anxiety with um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. He has about 30 years working in and studying global health, primarily in developing nations. Recently, he's... Oh, welcome back, Dr. Butler. Um, recently, sorry, he has been involved in the research and improvement of health infrastructure in developing countries with particular expertise in health systems of East Africa, more specifically Kenya. In global health, a particular objective of understanding health structure and improving access to medical services and medication in Kenya, working through Kenyatta University. In local and community health issues, Dr. Pitts has a particular interest in understanding the dynamics of medication adherence and health access in inner city communities. Welcome, Dr. Pitts. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Our next panelist is Dr. Shadrach Frimpong. Um, Dr. Frimpong was described by President Bill Clinton as the Paul Farmer of his generation. He is a nonprofit leader and public health researcher and scholar whose work is inspired by his background. As the son of a peasant farmer and charcoal seller, he grew up without running water and electricity in rural Ghana. Yet he became the first person from his village to attend college in the United States, graduating from the University of Pennsylvania in, two, in 2015 with the $150,000 President's Engagement Prize, Penn's highest honor. Dr. Frimpong founded COCO 360 and pioneered the Farm for Impact Health Equity model, a tuition-free girls' school and community hospital sustained by proceeds from a COCO farm. He leads a team of over 45 full-time staff members who have cared for nine, over 9,000 patients, served eight communities and counting, delivered over 80 babies, re reached over 35,000 farmers, and currently educate 240 young girls. Dr. Frimpong is a recipient of many awards, including the prestigious Samuel Huntington Public Service Award, which has past recipients such as the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, and MacArthur Genius Fellow, Dr. Angela Duckworth. In September of 2017, President Bill Clinton named him to the CGIU's honor, honor roll, and in June 2018, Queen Elizabeth awarded him the Queen's Young Scholar, Young Leader Award at Buckingham Palace. In 2019, Dr. Frimpong was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list of top social entrepreneurs in the world and was one of six recipients of the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award, which recognizes activists who work towards social change um, under age 30. In May 2019, Dr. Frimpong graduated from the University of Pennsylvania's Master's in Nonprofit Leadership Program as a recipient of the Richard Estes Global, Global Citizenship Award. He graduated from Yale University's Advanced Master's of Public Health Program in May 2020 as a Horseman Scholar and was awarded the Lowell Levin Award, a top prize for the best graduating student in global health. Welcome, Dr. Frimpong. Thank you. Thank and you. our last, our last panelist is Dr. Butler, who again we've somehow lost, but hopefully he'll come back. Um, Dr. Thomas E. Butler II is a general surgeon in Chester, Pennsylvania, specializing in general surgery and transplant surgery. He actually informed me that he's on call today, so maybe that's why we're losing him a little bit. Um, he graduated from Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in 2006 and has 16 years of experience. Dr. Butler is associated with, is, sorry, is affiliated with the Crozier Keystone Health System and Taylor Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Butler, as well. So um, this will be um, sort of like a Q&A panel. And OK, welcome back, Dr. Butler. Hi, I'm switching to my <laughs> phone. I'm, I'm in the matrix here, apparently. It's, it can be difficult with these virtual logistics. Um, so yes, so it's going to be sort of a Q&A um, format, and if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to um, message me and I will ask the questions. 
Okay, so just starting off, um, this is for everyone on the panel. Um, the first question is, what made you pursue your current interest in business and what important lessons have you learned so far in your journey? And I guess we can start with you, Dr. Pitts. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm very glad to be here and uh, excited about this discussion. We have um, my, my journey into business, particularly in uh, the area of small health care clinics in Philadelphia, has actually um, was actually born of just seeing the need for individuals who are in marginalized communities to uh, to to treat them and to see that they receive equitable health care, um, and so why so it's not so 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 my area is not business as we might uh, ordinarily ordinarily think of business, right? Uh, in as much as uh, for me and operating a clinic that is mostly uh, a, considered to be a free clinic. It's about providing uh, equity in healthcare, uh, a level playing field, and uh, de determining really what are some of the social determinants of health for our clinics. Not much of that is done uh, in the city of Philadelphia, you know, whereby we, we treat hypertension, uh, diabetes, uh, respiratory diseases, et cetera. Um, but we don't pay uh, much attention traditionally to those areas of medicine where um, what what might be the causative uh, reasons for those disparities and for those healthcare uh, uh, issues. And so that's really what led me into the business of, of healthcare and more than that, creating a free clinic. Thank you, Dr. Pitts. Also, I understand that um, each panelist has a two to three minute introduction plan. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to skip over that. So feel free to um, go through your introduction. Sure. Well, no, I think uh, as far as my introduction is concerned, you did, you did, a, you did a, a, a really good job, um, uh, you know, and, um, you know, you hear these introductions and you say, well, gee, uh, <laughs> who, who is that person? I'd love to meet them. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the founding of, chief, chiefly, you know, what I'm involved in these days is the founding of, of Miriam Medical Clinics. And I'm only a joint, I'm, I'm a joint founder of Miriam Medical Clinics. And we, our, our belief and our mission is to uh, determine uh, healthcare issues in our patients, but also, as I said, the, the social determinants of health, we look quite a lot at uh, trying to create equitable healthcare, really. Uh, what I've been doing recently um, through Miriam is I've also been appointed to be the the director of the COVID-19 vaccination clinic at uh, Lewis Katz School of Medicine. And it's through Miriam Clinics that we've actually um, vaccinated uh, member, community members in the city of every uh, zip code in the city. And, 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 and it's through that lens that I've really had a front row uh, view of, of of racism in Philadelphia, you know, racism uh, ranging not only from um, disparate uh, treatment of healthcare issues, but also looking at uh, the disparate and uh, unlevel uh, uh, playing field, if, uh, as it were, as far as the social determinants of health, uh, you know, sh shelter, food security, education, employment those kinds of things and determining really how those aspects of daily living uh, feed into overall uh, racism. And we're, 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 we're hoping that, that over time, uh, Miriam clinics and, um, and the work that we do in, in, the, in the vaccination clinics can be instrumental in, uh, in leveling that playing field uh, of healthcare. Um, traumas exist in the city. And it's been, and the, those traumas have been uh, absolutely very instrumental in creating this vaccination hesitancy that we hear so much about. And, and racism really is at the root of creating uh, the seeds that have led to vaccination hesitancy. So that's uh, briefly about, uh, you know, what, uh, what what we are about in our vaccination clinics and at Miriam Clinic. 
Thank you, Dr. Pitts. Dr. Frimpong? Well, thanks. I mean, I have to charm me to say I'm not a doctor yet. <laughs> so you can call me Shadrach. Well, uh, here in Cambridge, submitting your, uh, submitting your PhD thesis does not necessarily uh, mean you're a doctor until they grant you that degree. So uh, I'm still waiting for that confirmation. But I'm, 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 I'm very grateful to be in the midst of actual doctors. Let's put it that way. We're speaking <laughs> so, into existence. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, no, but... Uh, yeah, it's just really, uh, you know, uh, quite just humbling hearing, you know, Dr. Pitt share, you know, the work that they do at Miriam Clinic and most importantly, um, you know, what led him to it. I mean, I think, I don't know, I'll probably speak for myself, but I'm pretty much, yeah, it's been 10 years, but still very much early on as far as career is concerned. Um, so just hearing from him and, you know, his experiences over the years is quite really, uh, truly enriching. And I think, you know, in terms of what brought, you know, it's probably start with the background. Um, but yeah, in terms of background, you know, I think you talked about it pretty much. Um, the only other pieces is, you know, I come from like this small rural community, which is about, uh, about eight to nine hours out from Accra uh, in the capital city uh, of Ghana, you know, so if you're gonna take the bus, it's just like all the way out. I mean, I tried to uh, see if I can pull up some, uh, you know, pull up some images, probably see if I can share my screen. Um, if that works, then, you know, people can get a sense of what uh, life out there sort of looks like. Um, probably bring some sort of life to this whole thing. I don't know, later. Um, so really, I mean, what we've been doing is just, um, you know, spending, spending a lot of time, really, um, after graduating from Penn, going back to, the, to my community and trying to, you know, work with them to start something. Quite honestly, I very much was, and I, I still think there's still a big part of me that is like that, um, just like pyramid, really, just like everyone, right? You, you go into this and you say, you know what, let's... Let's let's really see how this is going to go, because um, I, I was put in a spot where Penn had given me some funding and we had to go and do something. But I'd spent all my undergrad years just really pipetting, so I didn't really, you know, I was not, I was all in the hood. I was just going to graduate. In fact, I still talk, think, think back to it, it's like really preparing, you know, my uh, uh, AMCAS application. I think that's still the name, right? <laughs> so submitting. Pan, you know, uh, and one of my, I think one of my very good friends is, is, is at uh, Temple Med School, uh, Patrick. Patrick probably remembers those days, but yeah, we're just like looking forward to just, you know, go make money. I always joke that, I don't know, but if you come from the, the settings that some of us come from, you're not really thinking about, you know, you get a chance to go to America. I mean, you probably go, you know, African parents, they're probably telling you, you have to wait till, you know, maybe you're 70, 80. Then, oh yeah, when you have the money now, now you come back. So that's what, that's what I sort of like, you know, knew. But hey, we had an opportunity to do something and we just jumped into it. I think they allow me to share my screen now. So I don't know if it's working, if you can see it. Um, am I able to share my screen? Is it able to, do you see it? You Probably should be able, able to, but I, I have a different screen than what the participants Let me see, see if it works. Um, Chrome tab, this, let's see if this works. Sure. Is it working? Probably not. Um, no, we can continue. But really, I think in terms of the why that, you know, led uh, me to it, it was more that side, you know, just growing up in that kind of object setting. I left the village when I was like maybe 14, 15. Um, and I went to high school in the city for the first time. And I think at that point is when I began to learn about how much, you know, cocoa as a crop really gives to the Ghanaian economy, it's like about $3 billion in export revenue. And there are probably people on this call that love hot chocolate and all that. Um, but you think about that and you think about the people that make it possible. You're thinking about my parents, right? My cousins, you're probably thinking about myself because that's what I spent my childhood doing. And then learning that we co they contribute that amount and trying to compare it with the reality that, you know, I saw electricity when I was 14, you know, 
running water and all that when I had a chance to go to high school in the city. So that really drove me to it. When I went to Penn and I had that opportunity, I thought, you know what, maybe we could try to do something. But quite honestly, I was really ignorant. I didn't know a lot at the time. Um, I didn't do public health in undergrad. I did pure biology. Like I said, I did all pipetting. So, which I think in retrospect was a good thing because it meant that the only way we could succeed was learning a lot from the community and knowing how best to do what we do. Um, and, you know, that's what led us to what we do where, you know, we work with them to uh, tie all the pieces together as far as learning that, you know, if you want to address health outcomes, you really have to look at social determinants of health, like educational access and the actual healthcare access to you. But then beyond that, we also wanted to sort of a bit do things a bit differently than, you know, what I'd re we had read, I had read in part uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains and they were doing incredible things. But I, I used to think to myself, man, what if the donors stop giving money? You know, <laughs> it's, 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 and I think one of the most dangerous things and hurtful things overall is giving somebody hope and taking it from them. And mm. when something stops, that can be a very uh, serious reality. So that's how can we set up the sustainability piece. We took the farm revenues and then now we have farm, farm revenues that sort of, uh, you know, sustain everything. So really, that's my background. What led me to it? I don't know, bunch of happenstance and just really being lucky and having the opportunity to do this and learn from a lot of people. Yeah. Thank you, Shadrach. Dr. Butler? Sure, sure. No, let me just say, Shadrach, that uh, if we call Dr. Dre doctor for baking the chronic, I'm uh, welcome and happy to call you doc a little bit early as Dr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, apologies uh, for my technical difficulties. I'm uh, using my phone and I'm on transmit call. So if that happens, you know, if stuff happens, then I apologize ahead of time. And I didn't hear my intro, so I just sort of talk about myself a little bit. So I'm, I'm from the south side of Chicago um, and I basically lived this healthcare disparities. I didn't have to study it. You know, it, it basically uh, I saw it all years. My grandfather's from a small town called Wetumpka, Alabama not too far from Tuskegee. Uh, so I, I, I know the stories and I, and I saw the healthcare disparities just coming up. And I went later on, I went to Howard University where we, um, where, where protesting was in my DNA. Um, like if, if the food at the cafeteria was bad, we protest, like it didn't mm -hmm. matter. We just stood up on issues that we felt were going wrong. Um, later on, I went to Cal Berkeley where we protested Prop, Prop 207, talking about affirmative action. And so really, I, I came to medical school with a different mindset than a lot of my classmates, um, and which was a priority, primarily white uh, medical school. And so I joined SNMA and became the SNMA president while I was at, um, you know, at my uh, chapter at Southern Illinois and um, really continued the thought process of, of trying to help healthcare disparity and mentor and those type of things in medical school. But really, you know, at that point, you're just, I didn't have enough, I didn't think I had enough pool to do things that I really wanted to do. Probably wasn't until I was in attending uh, where I started to do things both in uh, healthcare disparities and in diversity. So I now sit um, on the panel of diversity at Drexel, where I'm an associate professor. Uh, I also am the um, site director for the clerkship for Drexel uh, medical students, and I am the associate pro program director for the residency. And so really my thought process for them is really trying to increase the diversity while, my, while I'm in the room, while I actually have power, because it's so important to have people mm -hmm. like me who understand the situations that, you know, minorities go through in order to, so that we can have representation, because a lot of this boils down to very subjective rules that people just don't understand. And there's bias in all of us, right or wrong. And so you really have to have a strong voice in those small rooms uh, in order to help in disparity. And so my work now is really twofold. Once, like when the pandemic hit, I think a lot of things, really everything changed, I think when when George Floyd was murdered, you know, and really people really from outside our communities really started to put money where mouth was and put rubber to the road and policy started to change. And so I found myself, um, you know, in 
transplant, we have a committee as well called diversity that I sit on. And really, I started to see movement in those communities as well, which was good. And so um, another part of what I do is a community influencer. Um, around the time of COVID, some of you guys remember Clubhouse came on board, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I was pulled into one of these Clubhouse rooms very early on and, um, you know, found myself on a stage with like, you know, a lot of people, I won't name names, but just like big names and really, you know, the, 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 the misinformation and the disinformation and distrust really, you know, it wasn't surprising, but the amount of vigor behind it was, was pretty bad. I mean, I, I mean, I actually was trolled on Twitter by like some very famous people. <laughs> um, and you get to see it firsthand people who really just distrust medicine. And so I tried to use that platform as like a community influencer. I'm on a pretty big, um, stage house where I guess you could say club with a couple of very, very important influencers. And so I try to use that hat, you know, to influence policy, mm -hmm. not on paper, but policy in the hearts and minds of people. And then the last thing that I try to do is, you know, I use grant writing uh, as a as a tool, you know, so I just got a, a grant to increase the amount of minorities in STEM. And so basically I'm bringing eight to 18 year olds for a week and give them, um, you know, a whole week of, of introduction to just what we do in the hospital. I'm going to give them a white coat ceremony. I'm going to call their names out and frog dissections. They're going to meet a lot of people that look like people on the stage mm -hmm. and they get to see that, you know, like, wow, these guys look like I do. They grew up just like I did. And I can probably do this because mm -hmm. oftentimes these kids don't even know first of all, what it takes to get to do what we do. And second of all, that they have the ability to do it. I mean, we all, you know, what we, you know, we all, what do you call the lowest grade, you know, in, uh, in, in, in medical school, the guy who has the lowest grade doctor, right? Everybody's yeah. that, heard that quote before. So not everyone, you know, has to, you know, have been a super all-star and be AOA and blah, blah, blah. Like we just need you to get in do well, and then, you know, then have some representation because having representation matters. Right. right. Thank you all for your inspiring introductions. I've been, I've been nodding away and like really feeling what you're saying. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, our first question I'm going to go back to was what made you pursue your current interest in business and what important lessons have you learned so far on your journey? And we can start with you, Shadrach. We can oh. skip the what made you part because I think you kind of covered that. Yeah, like, I mean, oh yeah, I think, you know, probably that part, I didn't touch it fully. But really, again, um, you know, I when I was a pen, I used to joke uh, with Patrick and a couple of the Ghanaians and the Nigerian guys on campus. We used to, you know, of course, the ladies as well. But we used to, we used to joke that. I, so I went to Penn as an international student. I'm like, man, had I not traveled to America, I would have never known I was black. You know, so it's like, because in Ghana, everyone's like black, you know, that's just, but, you know, the experiences you have and, you know, uh, as far as, you know, of course, uh, the experiences of racism and uh, professors not thinking, my biggest probably challenge of Penn was, when I look back, I think it was probably a good thing, but it's, good. it's also not ideal. It's not what's supposed to have happened. You know, I have a lot of experiences where, Pen, you know, those who went to panel, you know, maybe uh, PWIs, you can relate, right? You take some of these biology majors and stuff, and most of the time, you're probably like the only person sitting in the classroom. <laughs> so, so, and uh, it, it was hard because I think a lot of my professors probably struggled to believe that I was a guy making those scores, you know? So that was a really, um, for me, that just gave me a lot of motivation, man. I'm like, I want to prove you wrong. <laughs> it just uh, gave me a chip on my shoulder. But then beyond that, because I think probably that's what lent itself to those grades and probably uh, helped to secure the funding uh, that we used to start everything. But then it principally, it was just like, you know, growing up in the kind of settings I grew up in, I see Nestle, Hershey, downtown Pennsylvania, all these big guys, you know, you think about my community, for instance, mines, gold, cocoa, rubber, all the cash crops, and also the big minerals. I mean, I think it's the case of Ghana and many other countries as well. You could say the same for Nigeria. Nigeria has a lot of cocoa and oil. 
And you look at these economies, the folks that actually benefit a lot, most of them are actually not in there. They're all white Western Europeans. I know this because when I go to the mines in my community as a child, they're all just like, you're just going to see white Western Europeans and, you know, of course, sometimes Americans on there, on the cocoa farms and whatnot. Nestle will come tell my parents to smile for the camera so they can use it for their website. And so mm -hmm. I always look that, because when I was a kid, we used to, some of you probably had these experiences, but in the village, we used to like strip ourselves naked when it's raining and you just run into the rain. So <laughs> I always joke that I would not be surprised if one day I go to like, and World Vision used to come to my community a lot. I go to their office and I see a picture of myself as a kid naked in their office for their uh, uh, NGO, you know, all these kind of narratives they try to put out there. But a culmination of all of that was what really drove me into, in, into this work, you know, because the first year for me was really just after getting the funding from Penn, it was like, you know what? They gave us 150K, man, if I've done OCR, I worked on Wall Street, you know, that's maybe putting the med school thing on hold for a little bit at the time, so I taught. And then worked on Wall Street, done the pen OCR, like everybody does. Hey, I could get some Goldman Sachs good money, you know? Like, not too bad. Like, that's, and then we, we, we all had this whole dream, oh, you know, by the time you're 28, a nice house, 2.5 kids, and all of that stuff. So, but having that opportunity, I thought, okay, we could just go back and just try and put up a school, a health facility. And then after that, after a year, just, you know, hand it over to the government. That was just the idea, really. There was not much to it. But I think in my first year, after by going in the second year when we're done, and then I had the opportunity to attend some of these global health and whatnot conferences, I was just amazed. Because yeah? I'm sure Dr. Dr. Pitt will have stories, you know, I'm sure Dr. Batla will have stories. Like, I go to this conference, the folks sitting on all the panels, calling themselves global health. Oh, white mm -hmm. people, they don't look like me. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. And they, all their work is based in Africa. I said, this is insane. Like, I just don't understand. And they speak so authoritatively that I'm just like, man, I don't understand. Like, but then when I get on the panel, what they ask me, Shadrach, you have an amazing story. Can you tell us? how it was like growing up on the farm. You see that? I'm like, come on, man. I just finished the Ivy school. Don't you see that? Hey, what are we talking about here? <laughs> like, you choose to ignore all that? And then mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? We, we can just keep complaining. Or some of us, we can just take the tip by the bullhorn and just throw ourselves all into it and really build a career, a meaningful career around it. Um, and so... Mm -hmm. That's what for me led me to, you know, diving all deep in. I thought, you know what, I've grown up in these settings. I had like, you could say a trifecta of uh, advantages. I had so many unfair advantages in the space, which is I'd studied it, you know, I'd lived it and then I've actually done it, watching those settings. So I thought, you know, if I could position myself in that light, then I could be that kind of voice that my parents and the community members who should have been in those places, but cannot be there, at least I could represent them. Um, that was the first thing. The other piece was I thought, you know what? We could show that self-sustainable uh, innovations are really, really possible. And to some extent, that's what we've done. You know, when we went to Ghana in the first place, so we have an all girls tuition free school. We have a community health facility. The school currently has 270 girls. Um, they're like two store buildings on campus. It's just growing so much. And the community, we have about 100 acres of land. So on the 100 acres of land, you have the school on one side, you have the health facility on one side. And then uh, you also have about 70 acres of cocoa farm. And the idea of sustainability is really simple. If you're a parent, a family member, you want your child to attend that school. Once they write the entrance exams, they get in. Because we only admit 30 years, just we can't have everybody. But once they get in, you recognize that privilege and advantage. And in return, you're going to work on the farm. And then at the end of you know, every harvest cycle, community meets doing what we call community accountability days, take the farm revenues, and then apply it back to sustain, you know, what uh, you know, some of the some of the uh 
innovations we realized that the government was not addressing things like uh, uniforms, things like books. Uh, even recently, we are realizing that at least for the young girls in the school, even like those who are ancient, I think, you know, junior high school and all that, something like, even though I have six sisters, admitting that I was ignorant, something like, you know, there's a certain time of the month that because of whatever reasons, the teachers are noticing that we record some slight absentees. And so we realized, okay, we can take, you know, some of these funds to address, you know, things like, you know, maybe sanitary parts and whatnot. But that's a very community fully driven thing. The community folks work on the farm, take the farm revenues, address it. On the healthcare side, we noticed uh, that, you know, what I think in global health, we call it user fees. In our side of the world, we call them consultation fees. It can be, I know this because it's very personal. My mom now has chronic hepatitis because when she started, you know, experiencing the symptoms of, uh, you know, the acute condition, acute hepatitis, she would not go to the health facility. I mean, I knew that because, in, you know, in our side of the world, people go to hospitals to die. That's what we always say. But I'm like, man, why didn't you go? She's like, well, the last time I went, the doctor checked me everything and told me there's nothing wrong with me. I should go back. She says, I'm just an angry old woman. And then I have menopause. So I should just go back. And then she's like, well, okay, if I go back, then why don't you give me my, I paid I think it's like the, it's, it's about it's 20 cities like the equivalent of like four dollars i paid four dollars give me my money because you take that money and you didn't do anything on me no medication but then the point is you pay that money to access the facility to have the doctor to talk to you and just because of that experience when she was experiencing the symptoms of acute hepatitis she did not go when we knew it was too late and it had progressed to a chronic state and I, I think about how much money we spend every month. So same idea, we thought, okay, can we have the community members work on the cocoa farm, sort of a pre-financing healthcare mechanism. And then we're going to take those farm revenues to pre-finance you know, all your uh, user fees. So when you come to the health facility, we're gonna check you. The only time you're charged for something is when it concerns medications. And we did that and it's just interesting, you know, the healthcare services utilization thing just jumped up. We started, you know, diagnosing a lot of conditions that the government health facilities don't see. And it's just clearly because people are now, you know, they, when they go to farm, they don't feel well. There's no afterthought. You can just walk in. But that's the kind of thing that we've pushed. That's the kind of innovations that we have been able to bring into the space by virtue of the lived experience and then uh, the, the academic experience. Just really the commitment to trying to do something new in the space. Um, in terms of the biggest lesson, you know, to your second question that probably for me I've learned is just um, the importance of, you know, recognizing the knowledge that's deep-seated within our communities. You know, I, 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 I always say all the time that I've had the opportunity to attend, you know, all these schools. My mother always jokes, I'm too much over Leonard, but <laughs> I just love school. But the point is, there are certain things that with all these Ivy League and, you know, Cambridge education, they say that I have never read in a book, you know? It has got nothing to do with all the mitochondria and all the, you know, um, cell signaling pathways and all the biochemistry and all that cool stuff I learned of them. <laughs> so, but they're so intelligent and they're so amazing. They're so what we've learned, and so over time, my career has now pivoted to trying to understand what really happens when you engage communities well? What really happens when you engage even patients well? I mean, one recent quote I recently read by, you know, Sir William Osler was so fascinating, said, listen to the patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And I'm like, yeah. just do that? <laughs> well, yeah, you guys can probably tell me more about that. But it's the same kind of concept. We have to listen to the community. They're telling us the problems. And it's probably the biggest lesson uh, that I've, learned in all of this. And so nowadays when I go on nonprofits websites, especially global health nonprofits, their websites, and then I quickly go to the board of directors part and you can see they're all like white people based in New York. Well, occasionally they'll put some maybe Ghanaian or African there, but my contention still stands. That African is probably, if they're Ghanaian, Nigerian, they probably live overseas. They don't come from that community. So that's in very much essence the neocolonialism we are still perpetuating. 
these guys think by virtue of their money, it's enough. They should hold all the decision making when it comes to what things need to be done. So we just recently, you know, submitted a paper that, you know, <laughs> that's one thing I think academia helps you to do, helps you to speak a bit more authoritatively and not just anecdotally. We're arguing for the case of segmenting uh, board governance structures into 60%, 40% power and segmenting them into a 60% component, which is a community uh, implementing board. They hold to, community members should elect their own board wherever you work, and you should call it the implementation board of directors. Mm -hmm. you percent of decision making. They should have forty percent for the folks wherever they are decision making, but purely for facilitating. So we call those people facilitators. They can facilitate with their knowledge, their money, and all of that, but it should stop there. Um, so those are the biggest lessons I've learned. Of course, there's still a lot more to learn, but it's just really been an interesting journey. Um, and, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited to, you know, work with the communities. We work with eight communities now to really uh, build something special. Yeah. Thank you. And um, Dr. Butler, um, what lessons would you say that you've learned along your journey um, in like business with the communities and all of that? Uh, so the, the things that I've learned um, especially sort of being inside of medicine now is that one, um, like change isn't going to come unless it comes from people like us pushing the medical community to change. I guarantee you, I don't, I don't even have to look at who's in this room or who the panelists, I can tell you it's a majority minority. And that's usually what these type of panels look like. That's usually what racism panels look like. It's because obviously we have a, an interest in our own, um, you know, in our own issues, right? But we have to be able to engage the, the, the decision makers and the policy makers and people who are not on this panel. So really the purpose of the panel, I'm, I'm preaching to a choir right now. Like I'm sure, you know, like the music's behind me and, but this is not where, this is where the ideas come from, but the change comes from being able to sit in a room of power players and persuade another power player to be on your side. Now you have a, a voice of, of, of different people in different backgrounds who also can sway whatever that community is. I mean, I, I can recall I me mean, two statistics that stick out for me and you were asking like the reason why, like I do what I do. Um, there was a, a survey by the American, um, by AAMC. Um, and basically they said that there were more black physicians that matriculated in the seventies than, uh, 2015. And that blew me away. It blew me away. And it made me think, how am I not in these rooms and changing these things? And, um, and, you know, another statistics, I'm one of only 3% of black transplant surgeons, abdominal transplant surgeons I often joke that like we're all on a group text, but it's, it's true. We are all on a group text. And I can tell you that I don't know what the maximum number of people you can have on a group text, but I don't think it's a lot. So that'll tell you like how many of us are actually having discussions like this. Um, and I want to change those things, obviously. And so, but to change them, we have to be in the rooms and we have to sway, sway the minds of people that actually hold the policy. Um, because there are people that will place people in positions of quote unquote power, you know, I'm the diversity dean and blah, blah, blah. And they have no bite. They have no say. They have no, they just, they put the person there and it's like, look, we've got one. See, we're fixing a problem. And so you, you have to hold their feet to the fire and look at metrics. Like if you're going to write a policy, you're going to say, we're going to do something. You got to say in two years, we're going to go back and see what changed. And if it didn't change, we're going to be more aggressive. Just like the Rooney rule in NFL right now, right? Like you see things are not changing and the statistics are there. You got to do something, you know, more aggressive. And so I think that's happening and, and more and more. And the more we have people like the panel um, in those rooms of power, I think things will change uh, gradually. Those are really shocking statistics. I have not heard the one about 1970 versus 2015. That's really shocking. Yep. Um, Dr. Pitts, are there any lessons you would like to share with us that you've learned in your journey? 
Well, you know, I I simply, you know, I, I'm in awe of the of the comments that uh, you know, from Dr. Frimpong and Dr. Butler have shared. Um, you know, I, so this is sponsored by by Temple University, right? I grew up I I grew up three blocks away from Temple University. Literally grew up, and 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 the other day I went uh, actually on a walk outside my office, and and my office is located uh, approximately 800. Uh, steps away from from where uh, from from where I grew up in the first drugstore that I that I worked in. Um, you know, this journey for me has been really long and arduous around the globe, but it's brought me right back here. My sense is that between my formative years and now, not a lot has changed, right? And so I. I you know, we've academically we've made progress. Yes, we've made progress uh, in corporations and so forth and so on. But people who are able to have a voice, I think that uh, you know, one of the sentiments that that Dr. Butler expressed, uh, you know, I, I I take with me as as, as a key. Uh, now that I have the microphone, now that I am in the room, what changes can I bring about? in terms of policy, because what has happened is that even though we've made social changes, even though we've made medical changes, um, you know, advances, et cetera, things have not changed. In fact, you know, if you look at the statistic, as far as professionals that are uh, um, uh, practicing professionals, uh, that is a shocking statistic from 1970 to 2015. We have gone dramatically backward, right? And so, and there are a lot of sociological uh, reasons, not excuses, but reasons for that. And I think now, you know, we've got to do a couple of things. You know, we have to change the paradigm. We've got to change the narrative so that, you know, the, it, it's sort of the, the the decrease in the number of practicing professionals. You know, um, I'm my doctor is in pharmacy. Right. And I know that in pharmacy, you know, you do not see a lot of African-American uh, pharmacists, uh, you know, on the scene. You know, you just you just don't. And so what we've got to do is we have to reverse the narrative. We have to move upward instead of backward. And it's up to us to do that. The um, all of us that are on the panel here, all of us that are in in the audience, you know, there needs to be a diversity of what he, and that and that is engaging, you know, as was said before, engaging those who are in the corporate rooms, who are in the uh, the CEOs of the universities, uh, who are largely um, uh, Caucasian, right? And getting them on board. One of the things that I do in 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 my academic uh, setting here at Temple is that. I take uh, students on tours around the neighborhoods. I really want to take um, uh, individuals who are in the corporate boardrooms around the neighborhoods so that, you know, I'm convinced that if they see some of the issues that we're dealing with, you know, a lot of people come to come to the um, come to academic academic institutions in underserved areas. They go to their cars, they go to their offices, they don't look right, nor do they look left. What I want to do is educate those professionals so that those folks in the corporate setting, uh, in our universities and in our hospitals, to go out, take a look of what you're dealing with, look at the dumping on the streets, look at the, um, uh, you know, look at look at uh, individuals that are walking up and down the street who are homeless. How can we deal with those kinds of issues, and then on from that, deal from from healthcare issues? Um, we're we're not doing that. Um, I, I've learned that really that's where the rubber meets the road, and that's where we can begin to by by familiarizing people with with what's around them. That's where we can begin. To, to change policy. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, it really is about how we change, how we look at and how we change policy. Yeah, maybe to add to that, I mean, what's now says, um, you know, tying in what you both of you said, 
it just always hits me back to what my mentor at Teal, you know, is getting in. And he's the chief of pediatrics and global health there. And he's always talking about, he said, look, in a lot of, you know, interventions we want to do in our communities, whether here in America or, you know, uh, back home on the con uh, in Africa, wherever, it, it really just comes down to power and power is always tied to money. So he always, he's like, in fact, I remember like starting two years ago, he said, so what you guys have been doing? Hey, can't you think about any, any way to move into the, move it into the for-profit domain? Um, and really I start thinking, <laughs> I start thinking, and it's amazing. Of course, the for-profit domain is a whole different area that, you know, you attract venture capital so quickly. Um, I, I find that, you know, the same corporate guys that well, I used to quote unquote think they're very evil, uh, the guys with the money, because they wouldn't give to nonprofits. Corporate folks don't. But then you turn it into an app, something, and then they are all latching on behind it. And I found that I, I know that the folks on this call are very brilliant people, but hopefully we're able to have some few more folks who have interest in MD, MBA and that kind of stuff to mm. move more into those spaces uh, so that instead of us hoping folks do, we become the folks that actually do it too. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of the things that now has really taken a significant shift because you know, I'm in the face of fundraising, but I see the difference when I approach the same people as somebody wanting donations, and as somebody that wants um, funding, I want the investment. It's a whole different uh, kind of thinking. And I'm very glad, you know, looking at this, because when you look at, for instance, the World Health Organization, their priorities, I'm not going to mention a certain organization's name, but they invented something called Microsoft. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you what, we're in 2022, and because the guy at that helm loves polio so much, with everything going on in the world, going on in America, gun violence and everything, police brutality, the WHO's highest priority is still polio because the guy with the money says, let's do that. Mm. And so the more we can have our own folks, especially our generation, because I think our generation of you know minorities, you know, we are at a very, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, on the cusp of a lot of, you know, exciting things, but also, albeit difficult, but I believe that, you know, that presents a challenge for us to prepare ourselves, if we can, uh, to, you know, be the folks that are actually at the table moving the needle. Yeah. Um, going from your point of, like, the business aspect of things, uh, my next question is, how do you think that medicine and business interact? And how do you feel that these um, interactions impact underserved communities? We'll start with you, Dr. Butler. Oh, well, um, there's a quote, actually, that I always say. Um, medicine is a business. It is a business. <laughs> medicine equals sign business. Doesn't matter why you got into it. And you can have all the altruistic reasons in the world. The people that go into medicine usually have you go you, most of the time. Most of the time, people who go into medicine <laughs> are people who are going into it for the right reasons, right? I mean, we obviously could could have gone to business school, and we could have been, you know, we could have gone into pretty much what we want, whatever we wanted, right? If we were just aimed for the money. So most people who get into it as MDs are going into it for the right reason, but. The people who are making the decisions, the C-suites, it's it's a business. Right? Those decisions are made based on, is this going to keep my hospital profitable? And even more so now, COVID, COVID has totally changed the game because the hospitals that were like on the margin are either not here anymore or so far underwater that they're now changing their models. Mm. And so even now, like if you get into medicine, you will see. Once you're done, what you do has to make money for medicine, period. Now, it's up to you to make sure that you're using your platform and using your power to not only do your job so you don't get fired, but you also need to remember how you got to it, how you got into medicine, pulling the people up that want to get into it that may not have the grades, the GPA and things like that, or maybe from underserved areas and places. When you're there, you have to remember just because that patient doesn't have insurance, you know, you, you get, you can do all of these, like you're a plastic surgeon. You, yeah, sure. Do all your, you know, your plastics things, make your money, but don't forget about the community that you're in 
mm-hmm. and and also take care of some of those patients as well. There has to be a balance. You can't be completely, you know, just like altruistic and I'm just going to do the things that feel good because the guy that's your boss is, that's writing and signing your checks is not going to be your boss very long. Uh, you <laughs> have to be you have to be profitable, you know, yeah. and, and the quicker you learn that, um, the better that you the better you'll be. And I think I think because of COVID, the, the, the magnifying glass has certainly come out even more. There's disparity in every single specialty. I can't think of one where the opposite is true. Um, every specialty. I mean, you name it. Plastic surgery, neurosurgery, obstetrics, of course, is like the gold star of disparity. Um, transplant. I mean, any specialty you can name has issues that we need to deal with. And so I think we just have to use our power um, to try to change some of those things. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. I feel like as an up and as an up and coming MD student, I really needed to hear that because some days, you know, you what what propels us is our like love for helping others. But at the end of the day, yep. it's not, not going to be that much kumbaya in the hospital. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, how about you, Doctor Pitts? How do you think that the yeah, space you know, I um. I've been learning about a lot about this recently because you know, I'm I'm in the uh, the area where we do a lot of um, we do a lot of service to the community, right? And render service to the community, but we do it through grants. You know, we've learned that there's a lot of money out there to do what we do in terms of advance of advancing the cause of um, of healthcare literacy, for example, right? Or or maybe healthcare screening and that sort of thing. And a colleague of mine who is um, who works directly in the area of of marketing, and for me, you know, marketing has been uh, a somewhat dirty word, right? But it's about marketing to the community as far as what services you can bring to bear as a healthcare professional, and the importance of those services be they diagnosed, diagnostic, um, be they medications, whatever, what, what's the importance of those services to the community? And it's all about marketing. It's all about the language that we use, right? And, it's, and, and the language that we use is important because that can go about, um, that can go about creating relationships and sealing relationships and, and sealing um and creating connections within the company, within the community. And then from those connections, and depending upon the language that you use, the way you phrase whatever marketing tools that you are using, marketing, again, being equated to the business aspect, um, that can that can create trust between the healthcare community, and, between the healthcare community, yes, uh, the institution, and the uh, community that you're trying to serve, right? And it's about that trust that will ultimately bring uh, those entities together, right? Ultimately, ultimately, that community, that surrounding community in, in, in the sense of Temple, for example, the 19140 uh, zip code, where there are huge pockets of distress, huge pockets of distress. And, um, but in order to bring that community together with the institution, with academia, with healthcare, we're going to have to have a conversation. The language will be what will bring all of this together. And it is the marketing that will be the tool, the ultimate tool that will bring those, those, those entities together, right? And through that marketing be able to attract not only patients, but you'll be able to attract funds through grants. You'll be able to uh, to attract uh, funds through uh, governmental organizations, you know, FEMA, uh, Philadelphia Public Health Department, et cetera, and you'll be able to get the work done. So I think there is an enormous role that we can, that, uh, that healthcare professionals can play as they seek to connect with folks who are in the business, tracking money. 
So I, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a recent convert to that to that issue, actually. So let me let just to add to to what Dr. Pitts is saying. You know, one of my really close NBA friends told me something that really stuck. He said, "People work based on incentives. Doesn't matter. At the end of the day." You have mm -hmm. to find what that person's drive is, that person's incentive. And mm -hmm. so when I think of trying to sway someone who's may just be a bottom line guy, I have to make, I have to find the angle where it will help him on the bottom line. What do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. So I won't say, hey, hospital, I want to bring these kids from, you know, from a small community outside of Philadelphia, Chester to your hospital and run them through the hospital because it's the right thing to do. What I do is say, the community that you're in will see this. The news will see it. This will be great publicity for a hospital and great publicity for your organization. He sees publicity as bottom line. And mm -hmm. now you two, two are talking the same language. Yeah. I'm empathetic to my causes, but he may not be. So you have to mm -hmm. find the common link between you two. And usually it's money. And you can usually find a way for your cause to be pro money, even if it is just putting a camera on something. And mm -hmm. so that's just, just the back. Oh, yeah. there, Dr. Pitts. Thank, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shadrach, um, how do you think that the um, like business of medicine impacts the most underserved communities? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm now probably talking about it from the standpoint of uh, an entrepreneur too. Because uh, I think they've done such a great job of talking about it from the standpoint of, you know, people that are actually on the front lines of, you know, uh, seeing patients and doing the hard work of surgery and, you know, doing the hard work of providing uh, prescriptions and all that difficult stuff. Um, from the entrepreneurial standpoint, I mean, you look at the U.S. entrepreneur landscape, right? Thankfully, we have a lot, couple of MD, MBAs who are, I mean, I was trying to look up. Uh, one of my colleagues, I just forgot the name. She's a Nigerian woman. She just became the CEO of uh, one of the biggest health tech startups in the U.S. Um, she got a medical degree from Kent's College, uh, but she studied in the U.S. for undergrad. And, you know, they recently raised like $100 million. So they're basically on the way to being valued at a billion dollars in like at most two years. Right? Now, she went into it because she was a physician in Boston, and she was realizing that the insurance companies had sort of like different policies mm -hmm. for the black patients and, you know, than the, the white folks. Like they literally were giving the benefits based on zip code. That blew her, her mind. And so she took, she, she, she was, I think at certain point was in charge of the Commonwealth Medical uh, Service or something, but she, was, she told me how that was enough for her she put it all behind her. She was going to be the person that still, you know, took things by the home. What's impressive is she still sees patients, but mm -hmm. so that she can still see that side of things too. But I think about that and I think about, you know, the entrepreneurial potential of uh, physicians in that space, because you, you think about it, there's no other entrepreneur that's going to be able to see things the way she does. As a black woman, <laughs> as mm -hmm. a physician and as the person in charge of, you know, a huge uh, startup uh, like that. And in our case, you know, it's amazing. Before I, before I moved into the for-profit arena and I still guide, you know, the nonprofit working very independently of me, obviously investors help you to do that. Um, we had the right people, you know, young Ghanaian woman, really intelligent now at the helm. And one thing I realized is, well, previously I was like, you know, we have a community health facility, 100 acres, a school is cute. We've done enough. It's fine. Like, and we're doing enough for the community. I got, I'm getting, you know, there's this public health degree, a PhD, so we can actually build a lot of evidence around it and all that. That was a nonprofit business thinking, really. But for the for profit, I mean, we recently just finished conversations around our company's, you know, valuation potential. And because we're a platform model, anybody, anywhere. So if you're a company and you're a platform model, you think about YouTube. YouTube does not produce anything. YouTube's product is their platform. They have two producers, they have two users. There's a producer, the YouTube content creators, and then there's you and I who go there to consume. And then they make money 
with uh, the advertisements and all that stuff. So we've been able to thankfully come up with a product that's also a platform model. And that significantly changed the game as far as, you know, what we could do with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all of that. And what we're trying to do eventually, I mean, some of you see it in the news because we're almost done with our fundraise, but really is the better way of how Oscar Health and CTMD and these guys are doing, you know, in the health tech space. Now I look at that, we get to, you know, use our experiences actually working with these communities over the years to actually do things right, most importantly. But then with this coming into the forum, thinking, wow, man, now I don't have, we, we don't have to think of just that school and that health facility. We could do more as far as healthcare for the communities. We could go more. And before long, we have investors and we're having conversations around building, you know, Ghana's first rural uh, medical school and expanding the clinic into a teaching hospital. Um, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, man, if I meet any medical student in the lab business, I'm telling them, you. <laughs> I hope you, you're able to come up with something because money is so much powerful. And then you're also able to convince, you know, like Dr. Butler uh, interestingly said, I found that those guys, they were not listening to me because I couldn't speak their language. Like those, our very first funding for Coco 360 came from Warbeck Pinkus, this private equity fund. For that first time I went to them, I, it was almost like they were sleeping. They were like, man, just hurry up. You know, it's like when I was done, they're like, hey, good job. Pass by our CSR office. We'll give you a nice 50K. Mm -hmm. Flight. Nice. Okay. Bye. Like, these guys are cold. <laughs> <I'm smiling. laughs> it's just like, so, because I mean, they have, their brain is thinking about the next, you know, billion dollar deal or spark or something. But now we approach them with all of this, you know, building the medical school. They're like, yeah, we can invest in it too, you know. Over the next, we can get this amount of money. And I'm like, here are my terms and conditions though. You're not going to sit on the board. They're like, well, let's think about that. So that's when I realized, man, I'm not going to involve these guys. I'm going to make my own money, <laughs> use my own money to do it. So that's the power of business. We're able to actually make a lot of important things uh, with the power. Because see, power is not a bad thing. It's like fire. But unfortunately, we are in a world now where power is in the wrong hands. It's like fire, fire can cook your food for you though, but it can burn you alive and destroy your home. So that's probably the most important thing uh, I'm seeing as an entrepreneur. And also being able to move the needle, you know, my colleague, I would later find a name and, you know, she was talking about, you know, bringing a lot of, there's quite some really remarkable uh, black health tech CEOs, mostly interesting, most of them MD, MBAs, who are actually in the US and they are banding together to force these Oscar Health and these other unicorns out there to basically take a certain component. So for every transaction, can we have 1% go to all your, you know, your patients who are in a minority to, mm -hmm. to, to losing up their, their, their what do you call it, uh, their, their healthcare expenditures if they're enrolled in your, in your, uh, in your, your insurance program or whatever. You. And I'm thinking, wow, that's the power of business, being at the table and being able to move the needle that way. Um, yeah, there's so much more we can all do, but in my experience, I sh I'm sure there's still a lot to learn, but some of the ways that I currently see, yeah. Thank you so much for that perspective. And I think going from um, all what um, you've said and what Dr. Butler mentioned, um, the altruistic nature of medical students, I think that um, a lot of us, um, would like to hear some like action items. Like, what do you think are things that we can incorporate into our medical education that will make us effective, like advocates at the business table for the people that we care most about? We can go. With yeah, that. I mean, I think you know, maybe incorporating. If I look back my experience, you know, full disclosure, I'm not. You know, I I can never put myself in you guys' shoes. I've not started medical school. Medical school is still in the in the plan because well I figured well if I'm going to build a medical school in a rural setting, I've lived it and all of that. There's probably no better person to be the person teaching uh, the students and all of that than me. I know hopefully eventually I can convince Dr. Butler and a couple of folks down there um, to go uh, help me on that journey and most, maybe a lot of you on this uh, call as well. Uh, but what I found, you know, with you know studying public health and all of these things was just always 
um, for me, the practical thing I did was I just, because I loved science as an undergrad, like it's still, there, there are days that, you know, I sit in my public health courses and I'm, you know, when I was at Yale, I'm like, man, you know, if you study this so technical stuff and you're sitting in class and you're thinking about how to connect public health to climate change, it's hard. <laughs> so like, it was really, really hard, but I'm like, man, okay, fine, I need a degree and all that. But one thing I was able to do so well, I think I was able to do so well, and I still do is, was carving a time each day to really think about the people that I interact. So every time I'm in Ghana, I go to our clinic, I get to, you know, work with a physician there. And when they're seeing patients, I'm always curious when I meet the patients, what are their stories? What are they saying? What got them there? Because I'm what I've come to learn, and you guys probably know a lot more than I do, but my little experience, it seems as though people come, it's, it's just beyond a disease, you know? It's like somebody's husband that beat them. Three months ago, somebody was totally fine. And then after a divorce or a breakup or something, they've been super stressed and then their health spirals. And understanding and thinking through these things is what in fact led me to, you know, we met this woman that her child on the way from school literally had drowned, gotten drowned in one of the mining pits that the guys, the mining folks were supposed to cover. That's what led to the business idea. We talk about how to hold these guys accountable. But when that situation happened, the whole family got sick. Like it was that serious. And I began to think, wow, you know, there's a lot that can happen when you listen to them. We're also listening to them is making us think through how to even restructure our health insurance and all of that. So what I can say is just making the time to think through things. And maybe perhaps when you meet your patients, if you can really see beyond the medical conditions and all that, and that's maybe you listen to the stories. Because what I see business to be, I, I, I used to be one of those folks that saw business folks like evil. But I've come to realize business is like a strong force to really like change things in the world, right? It's a very, it's, it's with the right people leading it, it's easy to get funding. It's not like a nonprofit, you have to go back funding because the investor knows that there's something in it for them. And you are able to actually drive change so fast when you have a business uh, uh, idea. And then that impact, you're able to drive it for these very same communities and for the very same uh, patients. So I always, and again, it goes back to, you know, what my colleague who is a practicing physician and is also, you know, the CEO, she always says, she's like, I'm never ever going to stop seeing patients because if I stop, these are the people I'm serving. I can't strategize again. They tell me everything I need to do right as far as the business model is concerned. So mm -hmm. I would say you guys are literally like in MBA courses when you meet your patients. Let me put it that way. Yeah. 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 May I add to that, um, please? And, 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 and I'm going to sort of expand the, the, or try to expand uh, you know, my thinking on, uh, on, on what business is, right? So we think of business as being in a corporate setting. We think of business as being really, uh, or uh, business being uh, in, in as much as we are selling things or we are creating uh, policies around selling things. Expanding that just a bit, and, I, and I'm, I'm because I, I've got the advantage, I've got advantage when I teach medical students, uh, I also teach pharmacy students. And I know that in uh, when I put on my pharmacy hat, um, and I'm doing uh, instruction in classroom in, in pharmacy school. Many of the, uh, the 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 rotations in pharmacy school lend themselves to actually spending time in business settings. Okay, and so there is the uh, spending time in um, during their senior year, for example, um, as they're studying for their doctorate in pharmacy, uh, spending time in a corporate setting or spending time doing rotations at a law firm, uh, also a part of business. And as far as uh, directing or learning how to direct the legal aspects of healthcare, um, uh, spending time um, uh, doing rotations at places like the FDA, right? Also, you know, it's, it's a corporate setting uh, that's involved in the direction of healthcare here in America. And one might say that, um, that yes, but what does that have to do with patient care? 
And, um, and, and, and my response to that, having been in those settings myself and having direct clinical research, is it has everything to do with corporate, with, 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 with uh, patient care, because we get to impact on a mass level, we get to impact uh, the healthcare of thousands, not millions of individuals, right? So bringing that fast forward, that's what we do in the pharmacy world. I'm not sure yet. Uh, what happens in terms of uh, a, a medical education and your residencies and your postgraduate types of, in, of of education? Because if I understood the question correctly, Tosin, you were asking, well, what can we as medical students do in our educational journey to make ourselves more proficient in the business atmosphere? And I would suggest that you know, perhaps there might be room to think, first of all, creativity, cr creatively and imaginatively, as far as your medical in, uh, education is, is concerned, and not limit your definitions of business to just the, the, the corporate boardroom as it is, the traditional corporate boardroom. But think in terms of spending time at, at, at uh, at, uh, at law firms, at the FDA, um, at other areas that might lend themselves to the creation of and the dictation of policy, and particularly African-Americans, right? Knowing that, you know, and one thing that you said that was quite, that struck a nerve with me, Shadrach, was knowing that when we are at the table as African-Americans or as uh, as individuals of African descent, we change perspective on how the, the quote unquote majority thinks, because many of them are not aware of really all of the aspects of what it is like to be black in America, right? We change their perspectives and we have a chance to influence that. You know, I sit down at the, uh, at, 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 on, on when I'm on the IRB or I sit down when I'm doing clinical research myself and all those designers that are around me doing clinical research, well, where are the white folks? I mean, where are the black folks here, right? And if I am African-American and I get to actually change their minds in terms of uh, what, they, uh, what they view in terms of medicine and how it applies to African-Americans. So, you know, just broaden your, your perspective around what uh, is considered to be business and think creatively and imaginatively about that. Yeah, I mean, to, to just put a button on it, I think my, my action item is pretty simple. It's just be involved early and often. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, the easiest thing in the world you can do is just be active. You know, you have to, when someone, like my chair comes to me, even though I know how thin I'm spread and he says, hey, would you jump on this? Committee? Yep. Before he's done with the sentence. Yep. Yep. I'll do it. Even if it's the, like I sit on pharma, a pharmacy committee right now. Like, do you, like, uh, uh, like no, no shame, Dr. Pitts, but you think I want to be in PNT. No, that the it, point it, of you should be. <laughs> <laughs> like like but I'm, I'm a surgeon you know what i mean yeah, like yeah, yeah, me yeah. To be on, the reason i'm on that committee is because it's experience it's experience <laughs> and how that committee runs and then yeah. an opening on the big committee you know mec or something like that and i want to run it usually minorities we don't have the experience you know right. we just haven't done it before there may not be minorities there but the candidates haven't even been on a committee before. So how can you be on the most powerful committee yeah. that's yeah, making yeah. decisions? So really, I like even early on, I was just involved just so I'm like, I have this experience no matter what it is, because at the end of the day, they just want to see that you've done something like that before. Right. And so now that's the easiest thing to do. And so eventually you'll end up, you'll find yourself in those small rooms with very pow powerful people. And I don't, I don't necessarily let people know my exact plans for that committee. Like I don't come in, you know, with the dashiki on, like, you know what I mean? Like, no, no offense. You know, like, you know what I mean? I don't come in and I don't try to scare away. I want everyone to be on board, even though in my mind, I know my goal here is to increase diversity. I'm going to do that the best way I know how I keep that close to the vest. And, yeah. 
and I, I, I try to tie everyone in because what you don't want to do is turn off the people that you need that are in those room as well. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those 48 laws of power. Like you just, you never <laughs> let them know what you're really, really going to do, yeah. you know, and have them, we'll cards. Have them know yeah. that experience. So whichever way you steer the ship, they're on board because you're experienced and it looks like the right thing to do. Yeah. And building, building bridges yeah. while you're doing all of that. Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. Absolutely right. Thank you all so much for your insight. I know that I've learned a lot from this panel. I just wanted to open it up to the audience really quickly. Um, if there's anyone with any comment uh, or any questions for the panelists, feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them out. Thank you for your um, contribution, Swathi. Okay, and if there's no questions, um, I'm just gonna redirect everyone to the main stage. There's a raffle going on um, and the prizes are really good if I do say so myself. Um, but I also wanna thank our esteemed panelists um, for their time. We really appreciate um, learning from you. Yeah. There's a question in the chat to um, Dr. Frimpong's comment. Um, Swathi asks, collaboration with for-profit organizations is very interesting. How do we self-police to ensure the excesses of for-profit institutions don't creep into the trust that was hard won from the communities that we serve? No, yeah, I mean, that's that's a very, very, very uh, big question. I think a lot of health tech CEOs like are talking about this thing uh, very, uh, uh, right now. Um, my, my experience has just been really simply, uh, you know, the, the fact that you have to change the people at the decision-making table. It's, it, it just comes down to it. I mean, you know, as a public health person, you know, one thing that we, we, we keep being told is engagement and we have to read this whole paper by, what's the name? Sherry Einstein talking about the citizenship, you know, the participation ladder. Um, and it's just about realizing that a lot of the mechanisms as far as uh, you know, involving communities in their own healthcare approaches and all of that comes into, into play are very much tokenistic in nature. So you may see, let's say there's a community hospital or even a big hospital, take CHOP for instance, you may just see maybe they will intentionally find maybe one black person and put them on it, really. But it's about moving beyond that to actually, you know, being intentional and seeing those folks, uh, the, the community, uh, the community members the importance of their voice. And it's something that, interestingly, I find that because whether a company is for-profit or non-profit, you're mandated, particularly by US law, to have a board of governance. And those are the folks that drive decision-making, right? And so it's at the highest level and it's the best place that you can ensure that, you know, some of the excesses and the bad things that, you know, unfortunately happen in the for-profit space don't sit in by just ensuring that there's a fair, a lot of people say fair. I think that we've had decades of unfair representation of minorities on panels. To say that should be fair is actually unfair because how do we go from unfair to now coming to fair? We have to jump from one extreme to another. That's my belief. <laughs> so my belief is now we have to have an unfair representation of minorities on those board of governors. And that's why our nonprofit, I'm gonna be honest, two, three years ago, the organization had to file its US IRS laws and everything. And those, you know, they, they helped us a lot, you know, but I just thought, you know, man, we, we can certainly do with more than just white people on our board, you know? So mm -hmm. I issued a very nice email and basically dissolved the board. <laughs> and then the next day folks wake up and it's, eight Africans, you know, some of, the, some of them are, you know, practitioners and all of that in the U.S., but they understand the settings that we're working in. And then the rest are just maybe two, three uh, folks that, you know, have the funding and whatever to support. And that shifted things quickly in terms of how we're doing things and influencing things. They understand the communities. We also have a lot of, you know, we have a community board who have, like I said earlier, 60% power. So for me, it's really at the decision-making side. If you can really drive things at where the power begins, 
and see the brilliance of the community members as equal, if not greater, than the money and the resources that the West can bring in, then you are able to actually achieve that. But I'll tell you, um, like I said earlier, you know, we approach a, a funder and they want to, if they give money, they want to come and sit on the board and have higher shares and all that in, in you know, our plans to build a medical school. And I said, no. So, <laughs> so it's also about, you know, that's why I keep advocating that as many of us that can be at the helm, we should try to be because we can stand by our convictions and then, you know, pull the plug if need be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. May I ask Shadrach a quick question, please? Yeah, uh, Shadrach, you had mentioned earlier that you read um, the book Mountains Beyond Mountain. Oh, yeah. it, was that the same book that was authored by uh, Leon Sullivan? Oh, so Mountains Beyond Mountains, I think a lot of people know. It was written by uh, Tracy Kidder about Paul Farmer. Okay. Paul okay. Farmer's work in Haiti, and yeah. I see. I was thinking of another, uh, yeah. another book that I'm familiar with. There are two more questions, but the um, the sessions have time limits on them, so we have to answer them really quickly. Um, one more question um, for you, Shadrach, is from Chi Chi. She says, as someone who would like to incorporate business, incorporate sorry, business into medicine in Nigeria, how do we begin? Yeah, I mean, you know, for the sake of time, the quick thing I can say is, well, Dr. Batma said a lot of that jump in, you know, because the jumping in and engaging is just going to allow you to learn a lot, really. Um, and there's a lot of, man, sometimes I hate to say it, man. I know Ghana Jollof is good and it's great and Nigerian Jollof is good, but I'm going to tell you, man, when it comes to the health tech startup space, space, when it comes to the diaspora, the Nigerians are great. So <laughs> you guys have a huge representation. My mm -hmm. friend Abe, who started Esusu, they just hit a billion dollar valuation. They were in the tech crunch a couple of days ago. Mm. Well, I'm from Lagos. So all I'm saying is that thankfully there's a lot of Nigerians in the diaspora who came from, you know, this, and, and I've done what you're trying to do. So probably your best bet to reach out to them. Of course, if you think I can be helpful in connecting you, I'm more than happy to do it. But speaking to those folks who have been there, done it, and learning and understanding what can work. And of course, if you can, and I actually think you should, go back home to Nigeria um, and then be in those settings and actually try to see and understand it yourself um, will be a real game changer, yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, the, um, someone in the audience wants to know if it's okay to share your contact information. So um, just let me know if that's okay and we can get that out to the um, attendees. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yes. Thank you all so much. We literally have three seconds left on this. So thank you very much for your um, contributions. We really appreciate thank it. You. Sure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tony. Bye now. Hello, everyone.